Well, hello, Grace Road Church and everyone else who's watching. Uh, I'm just thrilled that you've decided to uh, take advantage of our weekly sermon, and I pray that it will be a blessing to you this week as, as we look at Scripture together. Uh, we are going to be continuing in our sermon series through Luke's Gospel. We're going to be again in Luke chapter 14, so let me invite your attention there. And our text this week is only two verses long, okay? It's at the very end of chapter 14, and in these two short verses, Jesus gives us a mini parable. And even though it's short, it packs a ton of spiritual truth. So I want to jump right in today, and let's just go ahead and read this together. Luke chapter 14, verse 34 and 35. Jesus says, salt is good. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So again, a, a short passage this week, but, but before we jump into what Jesus was saying here in this parable, I, I want to make sure that we don't miss what he says after that parable. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now that phrase is recorded only two times in Luke's gospel for us. One here and one earlier back in chapter 8 after the parable of the sower. Um, and, and when Jesus says that, it's meant to cause us to sit up in our seats a little bit. Uh, to perk up, to, to pay attention to be ready to think, to be ready to reflect, because whatever it is that he just said uh, is extremely important, and not everyone's going to catch what, he's, what he meant by it. So, so with that said, let me go ahead and pray for our time this morning, okay? Let's pray. Father, we again are just so grateful for your word and everything it means for us. And Lord, we are grateful for the instruction it gives for our lives. Lord, we're grateful for the grand story it tells us. Lord, a story of your great redemptive work in history through your Son and through your Spirit. And this is good for us to hear and be reminded of because we live in a world that continues to shake us. We live in a world that maybe causes us to fear at times, perhaps tempts us to shrink back from our witness or, or doubt your active work in the world. But Lord, we're reminded in your word that your light shines through the darkness. And despite our brokenness, despite our sinfulness, you're creating a people for yourself. And so Lord, we're thankful, God, that you would call us your people and we can call you our God. And so Lord, we pray that our time in this text this morning would remind us of, of these great truths and what they mean for us both individually as well as uh, for us as a church corporately. And so, Lord, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, salt is an important ingredient. We all know that, right? Without it, food can taste bland and lifeless. In fact, you might be one of those people that, that like salt so much that, that when you sit down for a meal, you reach for the salt shaker and put salt on your food before you've even taken a single bite because you know that you want more salt on it. Well, Jesus here says that salt is good. And salt was used for many, many different purposes in the first century. Not, not only was it used for flavoring, it was also used for preserving. It was also used for fertilizer. It was used for weed killer. And it was even used as a catalyst for some kinds of ovens they used back then. But of course, here, Jesus isn't giving us a culinary lesson when he talks about salt. No, in a parable, he's teaching a spiritual truth. And the spiritual truth he's giving us here is this, that his disciples, followers of Jesus, both individually and the church corporately, we are salt in the world. In other words, we're supposed to be a distinct people. We are a people unlike all others because we have a unique identity and from that comes a unique purpose. 
And, and this is such an important truth for Christians um, to recognize, especially for us it, that's in a growing postmodern, post Christian context like ours. Um, I, I mainly grew up in a part of the country that's considered the Bible Belt, and, and it's called that because there's, there's churches everywhere, um, but it's also called that because there, there's kind of a, a social advantage to tell people that you're a Christian. It's this act of identification with the majority rather than the minority. And that certainly brings with it some advantages, no doubt. One example would be that that speech about faith and and talking about biblical values in a public forum really isn't out of place. It's kind of the norm. However, there's some pretty big disadvantages as well. I mean, the main one being the, the, the common conflation between this, this cultural or familial faith uh, against a true, vibrant faith in Jesus Christ. But here in New York, we aren't in the Bible Belt, right? And that brings with it some difficulties. We all know that. Expression of faith in Jesus is, is often met with hostility or, or at the very least skepticism. There is no social advantage to being a Christian, is it? Every culture expresses some sort, form of faith, some sort of faith, but the faith that's expressed in our context certainly would not be called biblical Christianity. But there's also an advantage for us in our context if we're willing to see it. You see, when we, as the people of God, we live out our identity, fulfilling the purpose that comes from that identity, our uniqueness, our distinctiveness will be much more clearly seen. And it is that uniqueness, according to Jesus, that is useful for his work in the world. We are salt, Jesus says. And and unlike salt that's put on something already salty, we can think of ourselves as salt on the most bland food imaginable. We will only make it taste better. Okay. But, but first, I want us to grasp this unique identity we have as the church, how the Bible describes it. And one of the clearest passages in the New Testament that speak to this uh, is in 1 Peter chapter 2. Okay? Uh, context is important, of course. This is a letter written by the Apostle Peter. Uh, this is the same Peter who walked and talked with Jesus, who, who was considered to be one of the three closest disciples to him, uh, eyewitness to so many miracles, including Jesus' resurrection. And, and in this first letter that we have in the New Testament, Peter is writing to Christians who have suffered persecution. And because of it, they, they've scattered. They've scattered to new towns and, and new villages They're living as exiles. In fact, that's what he calls them there at the beginning of the letter. And so this letter is written certainly to encourage them because they're going through some serious trials, but it's also written to instruct them on how to live as faithful followers of Jesus in a context that does not follow Jesus. Okay, and and I want to point our attention to chapter two, picking up in verse nine. Here's what Peter says to them. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So in this section of the letter, Peter attributes followers of Jesus with some very important titles. Peter says, we are a chosen race. We are a uniquely chosen people. That's what he means by that. We are a new humanity, as it were, upon whom God has set his love before the ages ever began. We're a chosen race. He goes on to say we're a royal priesthood, that we are royal members of the kingdom of God. And as such, we are a people who represent God to the world. And he says, we're a holy nation. 
Again, we're, we're a new nation, a new people group, a group of people with a, with a common culture, a common origin and language, symbols and beliefs. And, and this nation, this group of people, we're described as holy here, meaning that we are set apart from the world and set apart to God as this holy nation. And then he goes on to say, we are a people for his own possession, for God's own possession. He reminds them, we belong to the Lord. He is our king and we are his people. I I mean, out of all the people in the world, we are uniquely his. In fact, we are so unique, we are so distinct that we're described as sojourners and exiles, as he, he says there in that passage. Now, now they, the people who are, this was written to uh, originally, they were literal exiles. But that description is true of all Christians, right? I mean, a few weeks ago, Kevin preached an excellent message uh, on the city of God, uh, about being citizens of the kingdom of God and, and what that means for us. Uh, that, that God's people recognize that, that that's our true homeland. That's our true people. We're citizens of the kingdom of God and we long for it to be fully realized here. And so as pilgrims, like like Abraham is described in Hebrews chapter 11, we await a better country. That is a heavenly one, a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God as, as the writer of Hebrews describes in chapter 11. Again, this is just so important for us to remember right now. Um, let me just give you a completely random example. Um, just off the top of my head, let's say politics, okay? I mean, in the midst of the tribalism and identity politics that so characterizes our culture right now, the people of God have a unique identity in this world. I mean, this is why so many Christians have expressed this, this feeling lately of being politically homeless, We don't and probably shouldn't feel perfectly at home in either of the political parties. Again, because we have a unique identity. It is given to us, not in the forms of politics, but given to us in the gospel. And of course, the realm of politics is just one example. We could go on and on, certainly. But again, Peter reminds them, and he's reminding us too, from the words of Jesus, as the salt of the earth, we have a unique identity. We're a distinct people, and it's given to us by the gospel. But he goes on to say that brings with it a unique purpose. Look again at 1 Peter chapter 2, again in verse 9. He says, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Beloved, I urge you, this is verse 11, as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Again, he says, we have this distinct identity as God's people, but it's given to us for the express purpose of proclaiming the excellencies of the one who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Our mission to make disciples is inseparably connected with us walking in our new identity as the people of God. And so Peter gives instruction to the exiles of his day and to us as exiles today on how that can happen. What does that look like? And one of the major ways that the people of God are distinct is in their conduct, right? That's what he says, have your conduct be honorable, right? That, that is the, the way that we behave ourselves, the way that we treat one another within the church, the way we treat others outside the church is to be unique, distinct, different than the way the rest of society behaves. Again, an honorable conduct. So, when the world uh, seeks to destroy and debase their enemies, followers of Jesus love their enemies and pray for them, desire their good. And when the world thrives on spin and falsehood, followers of Jesus rejoice in and actively pursue truth. When the world cancels each other over the slightest of disagreements without any hope of redemption and reconciliation, followers of Jesus offer grace and mercy and forgiveness. When the world assumes the absolute worst in each other 
God's people assume the best in one another, always willing to offer the benefit of the doubt. When the world proudly flaunts its strength and its might, God's people are meek and gentle. When the world preaches that, that to live an abundant life, you just need to indulge in whatever your heart and whatever your body wants. Followers of Jesus, however, we know that the path to abundant life is paradoxically through the denial of self and the pursuit of holy and godly living. I mean, over and over again, the world that does not know God lives in such a way that proves that it's true, that they don't know God. And and that shouldn't shock us, by the way. I mean, like, why should we expect anything different? However, those who claim to be part of this unique and distinct people created by and shaped by the gospel, their lives should look very different. And don't miss that, that one of the main differences is brought out in this passage and many other places in scripture is in our speech. Right, look again, verse nine. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, this identity that we've been given uh, as God's people brings with it a purpose and Peter points it out. Again, it's a proclamation, right? And so what the people of God talk about and what the world talks about should be different. And I don't mean we don't enjoy talking about sports or or current events or, or even politics, certainly. What I mean is, is that there should be a constant and common topic in our conversations, and that's the gospel, who God is, what he's done for us through his son, Jesus, and what that means for us. And the gospel is certainly a distinct message in our culture, isn't it? Right, negatively, it's, it's this message that tells the world, you're not the God of the universe. I mean, you're not even the Lord of your own individual life. It's a message that tells the world that there is absolute truth. There is absolute morality. And you don't get to define what's right and wrong, what's good and evil. And again, this is a very distinct message for our day. That's that's negatively, but positively, the gospel is distinct by by telling the world the good news. That your worth is not in what you do or in what you possess. That you don't need to work your way to God. You don't need to try and earn his approval that there really is peace and joy and hope to be found in this very broken world and it's found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Again, and all of this is in a message that must be spoken, must be proclaimed. God's people are a speaking people, right? We speak a unique and distinct message that the world desperately needs to hear. But, we're distinct not in just what we talk about. The Bible's very clear. We're also distinct in how we talk. Look at what Paul writes in Colossians chapter four and verse six. He says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Again, being salt in the world is to speak in a certain way. And notice how Paul describes that unique way of speaking as God's people. It's gracious. And if you think about it, gracious speech really is distinct in our angry, polarized culture, isn't it? But Christians speak differently, or at least they should speak differently. Our goal in communication should not be to tear down and belittle someone else. Like our speech should not be characterized by condescension, sarcasm, or anger. No, no, our speech should be gracious, ready to build up and to speak truth and love. And by the way, that is true both offline and online, right? There should not be a difference in the way that you speak to others in person and the way you speak to others on social media. I mean, somehow many have believed that that the pattern of Christian speech can be different online than offline for some reason. But social media, you have to understand, is an extension of our speech. And and so what the Bible instructs about godly communication applies to your Facebook and Twitter use as well. And, And so if there is a difference between the two, your speech online and offline, 
That's hypocrisy. And, and you're failing to live out your unique identity and purpose as part of the people of God. Salt, whose every part of their life is seasoned with salt, including their speech. But again, we're, we're salt in this world, unique and distinct as we live as pilgrims and so, sojourners. At, at least we should be. Look again at Jesus' mini parable, parable back in Luke chapter 14. He says again in verse 34, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? So catch what Jesus says here. He says salt is good, but there is a chance for the salt to lose its saltiness. There's a chance for it to lose its distinctiveness, its uniqueness. And that sounds strange because table salt or, or sodium chloride actually cannot lose its saltiness. At least that's what I've read. I mean, I'm certainly not a scientist. I'm not a chemist or whoever would know that fact. Uh, but in saying that, Jesus could be expressing a, a few different ideas. He might just be pointing out just how absurd it would be for that thing we would identify as salt to not be salty, for it to not, for it to not embody its uh, very characteristics. However, he could be referring to the salt that's found around the Dead Sea, very near to where they were. The salt there is actually a mixture of sodium chloride and other compounds. And what happens is that water evaporates from it, and it, and it from this mixture, and the sodium chloride, that, that real true salt, crystallizes and can be removed. But then what's left over is gypsum and, and other impurities. And what's left over, it, it's like salt, but it isn't salty. And I think what Jesus is warning us with here is, is, again, we have to be careful that we don't lose our distinctiveness in the world. In fact, we might say, just like salt needs to be salty to be salt, a disciple needs to be disciply to be a disciple. That is, there are certain characteristics that make a disciple a true disciple. And if those things aren't there, it's really just an imposter, not the real thing. And again, this is a massively important truth we need reminding of in our culture that moves further and further away from biblical Christianity. Because what happens is in an effort to gain a hearing uh, or acceptance uh, with those outside of Christianity, Christians and churches are tempted to either bend or compromise those distinct beliefs and, and values and behaviors that are not accepted by the culture at large. We've seen this over and over again as churches move from, from historic biblical orthodox stances on, on all kinds of issues, issues related to sexuality and supernaturalism and, and the ex exclusivity of Christ. Uh, I mean, this is true of a number of mainline Protestant de denominations over the last century or so. But we have to be careful because what Jesus warns us here is that it's possible to look like salt, even claim to be salt, but in losing our uniqueness, we become something altogether different. Uh, in fact, there was a classic Christian book uh, written in the 20th century. It's a book called Christianity and Liberalism. It was written by a guy named J. Gresham Machen. And uh, it was named one of the top 100 books of, of the millennium by World Magazine and, and one of the top 100 books of the 20th century by Christianity Today. So pretty important book in church history. And just to give a little bit of the background of the book, Machen was a theology professor at Princeton Theological Seminary in the early 1900s. Uh, but what happened as he was there was, was the board at Princeton shifted to embrace more liberal views. And, and I don't mean political liberalism. We're talking theological liberalism here. And they, they embrace these liberal theological views concerning a number of aspects concerning the Christian faith and scriptures, namely the supernatural. They denied the miraculous in, in favor of this liberal naturalist view, which was seen as more intellectual, more scholarly, more acceptable. And understand, they weren't trying to like tear down Christianity. They weren't trying to refute Christianity. In their minds, they were trying to pro progress it. They believed they were doing something good. But Machen and a few of his colleagues, they just couldn't agree to it. 
They saw this as a tremendous mistake that would lead to, to further theological compromise across the board on, on many, many different doctrines. And, and so what happened was Machen and, and some of these other um, professors left Princeton to begin their own seminary. It's a seminary now called Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. They started in 1929. And, and not long after that, he wrote this book, Christianity and Liberalism. And, and he wrote it to refute the claims of the liberal theologians of his day, but in reality, I mean, it's just as relevant today as ever. And, and this is the main thrust of his book. Th this is what he wrote. He wrote, in the sphere of religion in particular, the present time is a time of conflict. The great redemptive religion, which has always been known as Christianity, is battling against a totally diverse type of religious belief which is only the more destructive of the Christian faith because it makes use of traditional Christian terminology. He goes on to say, what the liberal theologian has retained after abandoning to the enemy one Christian doctor af doctrine after another is not Christianity at all, but a religion which is so entirely different from Christ Christianity as to belong in a different category. And that in abandoning the embattled walls of the city of God, he has fled in needless panic into the open plains of a vague natural religion, only to fall an easy victim to the enemy who ever lies in ambush there. Now, what, what was Machen saying there? What's he doing there? He was saying, liberal theology is not similar to Christianity. It's something altogether different. Again, if salt has lost its saltiness, it's no longer salt. It's no longer useful. I mean, it might sound like Christianity. It might use the same terms as Christianity. But it, as he, he puts, belongs in a distinct category of its own. And we would agree. We want to hold to orthodox biblical doctrine and values in a world even a world that might be labeled, it might label itself as Christian as, as it moves away from those doctrines and values for the sake of progress or acceptance. And in fact, the church has often been called a community within the community or, or a city within the city. And, and that's true, but understand, we're to be a contrast community. We're to be a contrast city, contrast society. We speak differently. We live differently. And, and again, it's not for the sake of being different or, or with some kind of elitist attitude or posture over other people. No, we're different for the sake of the world. We're salt and we're light in the darkness. And when we walk in our distinctiveness, we do so to the praise of the one who's created us as his people, but also so that others hear the message of the gospel and see lives that exhibit grace and love and mercy, all with the hopes that they might be added into the fold. And again, to lose our distinctiveness is to weaken that effect. It doesn't strengthen it. It weakens it. Again, Jesus provides clear warning here. Look again one more time at Luke 14, 35. Talking about salt that's lost its saltiness, he says, it's of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown away. Understand, our usefulness is tied to our distinctiveness. It, like if we're going to be useful in this world, individually as Christians, corporately as the church, we cannot take on the world's distinctives, but we have to rather embrace and exhibit the distinctives of the people of God. Like if we're going to reach our cities, if we're going to reach the nation, local churches, which are local expressions of the people of God, we have to live in a way that proclaims the excellencies of the one who's called us out of darkness into marvelous light. There is darkness and there's light. There's a difference and we live that way. Again, Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear. And that's a cause for reflection. So it's good for us to consider, what should our response be to these words of Jesus? Let me offer us just four responses very quickly to the call to be salt and the warning to not lose our saltiness. I, I think there's four. We should respond with, first of all, attentiveness. Attentiveness. We need to be attentive to our lives. We need to be attentive to our individual lives. We need to be attentive to the corporate life of the church. And so we ask the question, 
are we living in a way that would be considered in contrast with the world? Is our behavior, is our speech, is our, our attitude shaped more by the gospel or more by the surrounding culture that knows nothing about the gospel? Again, we need to be attentive to that. In fact, the, the Apostle Paul, he, he gave similar instructions uh, to Timothy, who, who is a young pastor in Ephesus. Uh, in his first letter to him in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he, he says this to him, verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You know, as a church leader, Timothy needed to be attentive that his personal life and his teaching, his doctrine would remain in line with the gospel because it had serious implications for himself and and all those who see his life and hear his teaching. And and though this was in, this is his instruction um, that's for pastors, certainly, I really think it's important for all Christians, right? Like it's good to remain attentive and consider is my life exhibiting the unique and distinct characteristics of those who claim to belong to the Lord? And then secondly, I think we should respond with repentance. We should repent for all those ways that we failed to live in a way that accords with godliness and holiness. It's gonna happen. We're gonna fail. We're not perfectly holy people. Sometimes we say things we shouldn't say. We hold attitudes we shouldn't hold. We do things we shouldn't do and the world sees That's going to happen. But the good news is that just as God has shown us grace by adopting us as his own and creating a new people for his possession, he continues to show grace even when we fail him. Like a good father who does not kick out a son or a daughter for failing to live up to the family name, God does not kick you out either. In fact, David wrote these beautiful words, Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14. He says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. And so let me encourage you, come to him this morning. Come to him with your frailty and your weakness to live up to this high calling of his kingdom. But know that he forgives you and he keeps you And he equips you by his spirit to continue on. Which I think leads to our third response, which is perseverance. Perseverance. Again, knowing that we have this unique identity and this unique purpose in the world tells us that it's probably going to feel pretty lonely at times. Again, at work, at school, or even at home, there's going to be countless opportunities to allow your thinking and your behavior be shaped by non-biblical influences but we're called to hold fast. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 10, verse 23 to 25. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. And notice in those words that the call to gather, to be with other members of the distinct people of God. The reason is, is is we're so often bombarded by society's ideologies and philosophies and theologies that go against biblical teaching. We're so often bombarded by our own flesh to not live by the spirit, but by the old nature. And because of that, we need one another. We need each other to spur one another on to faithful perseverance, he says. So listen, don't neglect it. Let's persevere. But finally, fourthly, I would, I would say we should respond with faith. You see, it's tempting to think that uniqueness, when defined by gospel faithfulness, is a terrible strategy for reaching a world that's hostile to the gospel. But listen, let, let's believe this morning that, that God is working through us as salt. He's accomplishing his purposes. He's drawing others to himself. He's adding to his people. And we have that faith as we look to Jesus who came to a hostile world. He endured hatred and rejection and ultimately the cross. And yet he's accomplished redemption and ultimate victory for all eternity. He uses us in the same way. Through our witness, through our proclamation, that that gospel, the good news of what he's done and only he could do is, is proclaimed to a watching world. But that only happens through the unique and distinct people of God. So listen, let, let's be that distinct people of God 
in our world to the glory of God. Let me pray for us this morning. Lord, again, we're just so thankful for your word, God, its instructions. Lord, again, as I prayed earlier, Lord, it tells this great story of what you've done for us in history through your son. And so in some ways, we sit back and watch you as, as the author of the story and the main actor and character of the story. And yet we're also drawn into the story. We're participants. And so God, you've saved us individually and, and brought us together to form a people, a people that represent you, a people with a new identity, chosen before the ages began to be set apart for your, for your glory and for the good of this world. And so Father, I pray God that we would heed this call this morning that, that we be the salt of the earth. Lord, that we don't shrink back from our uniqueness. We, we're not, um, help us to not give into temptation to bend or compromise our beliefs and values even when they're met with rejection and hostility in this world. But Father, help us be persevering. Help us be faithful. And Father, we pray, Lord, you do your great work through us individually and as a church corporately to be the salt, to be the good for this world. Again, help us be faithful. And Lord, we pray, God, that you would um, bring many, many more people into your kingdom, into your, your people Lord, alongside us. So Lord, encourage us with that vision. Encourage us with that that belief that Lord, you are working good even in a world that feels just so hostile to us. God, again, we're so grateful for your grace and your spirit that equips us and enables us to be the unique people of God. God, I ask that you would bless our church, bless our people, Lord, this week as we go to those different Um, uh, arenas to to work and school and even at home. Again, may we be faithful, salt and light to your glory. Father, we pray all of this in the name of your son. Amen.